Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Um, just the usual bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, we're recording tonight's event as usual, so do keep yourself uh, muted throughout. If you have any questions for the artists, if you could type them into the Q&A facility so that when the artists finish talking, they can then type their answers. Um, we've only got um, ten, we've only got ten minutes for each artist, so um, we don't have a huge amount of time for actually answering questions uh, during the talk. But when the four artists are finished, we may have time to sort of roll, finish off with a few uh, more questions at the end. Okay, I'll now hand over to Mary Bourne, who was a member of the selection panel. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me all right? Panelists, can you nod? Yes. <laughs> Good. Yes. <laughs> welcome very welcome to um, our second in this event of Whistle Stop uh, Studio Visits um, uh, to accompany the 195th RSA Open Exhibition. Uh, all the people we have talking tonight have work in the exhibition, which is a, it's a particularly strong year, and I, I hope very much you'll all visit the website if you haven't already and had, have a look at their work and some of the associated material. One of the advantages of the online exhibition is that we're able to include um, videos of explanation and little bits of text and so on with the work. So there's quite a lot to explore there. Um, we are going to quite simply go one after the other um, and uh, there may be a tiny bit of time for questions in between but we are quite pushed um, and I'm sure you will want to spend as much time in people's studios as possible. So I think without further ado um, I'm going to move on to the first speaker who is Lauren Ferguson, who is a recent graduate from Gray School of Art in Aberdeen, where she obtained a first class degree. She's been selected as one of the RSA's new contemporaries this year, although we'll have to wait to see her work in next year's exhibition. And she's currently artist in residence at Leith School of Art. So I'm gonna hand over to Lauren and I may butt in and ask the odd question, but uh, mostly she's she's going to show us around her studio and talk a bit about her work. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Mary, and um, thank you to the RSA for this opportunity to talk about my work. So as Mary said, I'm Lauren and I am based in Edinburgh. My studio's in Custom House, which is down by the shore in Leith. I graduated from Grey School of Art with a degree in painting last July. And um, since graduating, I was delighted to be selected as artist in residence with Lee School of Art, um, which has been an incredible opportunity for me to expand my practice and develop my passion for teaching with the students at the art school. Um, having this amazing studio space has also provided with me the opportunity to challenge my work, particularly with scale. And um, so I'm really excited to have had two pieces selected for the RSA exhibition and I'm going to share with you them the screen just now. So my practice derives from a sense of place which has developed through an in-depth exploration by exploring history, architecture and objects within places with which I have a personal connection. Um, and through drawing and painting, I develop open narratives about these places by considering collective, individual and social memories. And I'm really interested in how the connections between these memories and the historic architecture um, objects and what their relationship is to the surrounding landscape. So my ideas always begin on sketchbook, in sketchbook drawings within the landscape, which then expand into larger media. Um, usually through graphite or smaller scale paintings. And my research into psychogeography um, has really influenced the way I experience the place. Um, it follows this playful and inventive way of navigating an urban environment. Um, and it's changed the way I examine places when I'm walking and recording through them. Um, so this piece is Ought to Play and one of the pieces selected for the show. And it's personally a really significant piece because it was the final one that I made for my degree and was also made during lockdown. 
Um, having been evacuated from Grey's last year for lockdown, my new studio became my brother's flat living room, um, which is where I created all of the work for my degree. And these are the two final drawings that I did. Um, they were influenced by everything that I've talked about, about memory, place, literature, psychogeography, but also by this new situation which we found ourselves in. During lockdown, places became isolated and parks which were once full of children were now absent. Um, so this kind of new abs like haunting absence within spaces definitely influenced my work then and has continued to since. Um, literature has played a significant role in my practice as well, particularly the poetry of Robert Louis Stevenson. Um, Stevenson's poetry captures moments of fragility, vulnerability and exposure as a young boy. And I found that these perfectly linked to the narratives and ambiguous atmosphere that I was trying to create in my work. And I also use lines of his and um, fragments of his poetry to inspire the titles for my pieces. So with being artist in residence with Leith, I have had the opportunity to expand upon a new area of research. Um, and this is Colin, which is a place that I spent many childhood memories. Um, and I'm exploring it by using archive material, videos, photographs, um, and revisiting the location to recall these memories. So in exploring this area, I became really fascinated by the domestic objects and objects which many of us would associate with our everyday life. Um, this has been really influenced by the writing of George Parekh, who has inspired me to pay close attention to the ordinary and the insignificant of everyday life within spaces. Um, I can find like the interesting aspects within even the most like banal objects. Um, many of Parekh's works deals with this absence, loss and identity, which are themes that kind of filter through my work as well. And like Parekh, I've got this interest in mapping movements and spaces, otherwise taken for granted and infusing these mundane objects with meaning and detail. So this diptych um, captures the domestic washing poles. Um, I've given this a new narrative by removing them from their context and creating this absence um, and also tension between the missing wire where the clothes would hang. Um, and there's like a drawn realism, which echoes kind of this uncanny nature of everyday objects. So I'm going to stop sharing and I can actually show you these pieces in the flesh. I, I'm interested, um, Lauren, in that last one, uh, in the way you've displayed it with the bull clips, bulldog clips, pegging it. It's like the physical reality of the drawing and the subject are coming together. Is that something conscious that you've looked at? Yeah, the um, paper is like really important for me and actually seeing the physical quality of the paper and it hanging. And um, I think like the way that it floats off the wall when it's on these bulldog clips is quite meaningful because paper is really fragile. And I think that relates to um, the, the way I'm trying to convey like memory and um, this kind of fragile thing that could easily be torn or, and that's part of the process as well. Um, I'll go up close with these works, but um, so when I'm working, um, I start with plain white paper, but I use graphite powder and I rub this over the surface and um, with a rag. So it creates this textured and um, gray background and that's really important because it picks up marks from underneath and adds to the depth of the drawings and then um, I use graphite pencils to go through to create the pieces and um, you can see them hanging here it's the luxury of there not being a physical show I still have the work in my studio and uh, so here are a few other drawings that I've done I love working on big scale and the bigger I can go, the more ambitious, like I, I like it. And I, I built this wall at the back of my studio. I don't know if I can get it all in, 
uh, so that I could do large pieces and also pin all the drawings with bulldog clips. So it's really mobile space to work in. Um, I'm also a part of my practice that I love still doing is painting. And these are some small scale paintings which I've been doing um, working from old photographs. Some of them are still in development um, exploring uh, family heritage and connection to people that I never actually met, but have only learned about through stories. Um, just to, so for my drawings, I usually start with smaller scale studies like these, um, which are developed from initial sketchbook drawings. Um, and then I take them onto the larger scale. And um, further around in my studio, these are the photographs, which I have um, kind of as an inspiration wall. And then I was looking at them for so long that I wanted to make paintings from them. And so that's some of them here. We have these amazing windows in our studio. So north facing light all the time. <laughs> and these are all my sketchbooks lined up here. Um, I don't know if you can see, I've got all my pencils lined up here rather obsessively. <laughs> Those are really cool. <laughs> Some of them are so small. I don't know if you can see that. Um, but I still keep them all. It's a nice memory of um, the time and process of working. And further around, this is where I do my paintings. So I've got my easel and my palette. And in the background there, I've got artist research and some more memory drawing. Um, I'm just going to sit down. This is a book that I have, which has got the complete collection of what we've seen since poetry. And I go through this all the time to find new inspiration for drawings and also the titles which I was talking about earlier. Um, another part of my process which I find really important is this idea of time and um, time in relation to memory but also the way I make my drawings and I actually record every minute and hour and seconds spent on um, pieces uh, alongside the date. So this is um, kind of a piece in itself, a continuous, you can see that time recording. Um, um, that's can, amazing. <laughs> it's a bit <laughs> obsessive, but that's just who I am. And um, it's nice to look back and I haven't actually ever worked out the exact time that I've spent on a drawing, but um, it's nice to have it there. And I can... <laughs> You could do a nice calculation with the Scottish Art Artists' Union rates of pay and then work out how much each piece is worth. Yeah. <laughs> <you were. laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, these are the like initial, some of the initial drawings that I've done when out in the landscape. And um, that's what I love doing most and um, actually physically being there. So I'm looking forward to now that we can travel again, getting back into these spaces. And the thing about my sketchbook drawings is they're a lot looser and freer. Um, I think because by cons time constraint or weather, um, so it's very different to the timely drawings I do within the studio. Um, unfortunately, Lauren, we're running out of time now. That's um, okay. <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna wind it up now. But if people want to type any questions for you into the Q&A and if we have some time at the end we'll, we'll come back. That was just so interesting and I think that relationship between time and memory and place, the sort of gaps between remember places and, and how perhaps they are now is, is really fascinating. I'm sure it'll be a lot more for you to research <laughs> as time goes on. Um, you can see more of Lauren's work on her website, which is uh, laurenfergusonart.com and uh, on uh, Instagram at laurenfergusonart and of course on the RSA annual exhibition website. So fantastic, Lauren. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>
so next um, we are going to move on to uh, Maya Rose Edwards. Here she is. Um, Maya uh, is a, oh, I've got my introduction here, but I can't see it. Here we go. Maya is a visual artist originally from Yorkshire, but has been studying and living in Glasgow for the past three years. And she's due to graduate from Glasgow School of Art this coming June. So in fact, still a student. Uh, mm. Maya has previously exhibited at the Oxo Tower in London in 2018 and at various sites throughout Glasgow. Some of you may have spotted her work illustrating the four star review of the RSA annual in the Times last week. Uh, <laughs> so that was great to see her work there. She works, uh, she works primarily in sculpture and installation, um, often relying on everyday objects that are to hand and makes work with the aim to displace the hierarchy of perception back to the realm of the pedestrian. So I will hand over to you now, Maya. Uh, yeah. I'll try not to interrupt, but I might. <laughs> <laughs> Please feel free to, and thank you, Mary, for your intro. Can you hear me? Cool. Right. As you might be able to tell already, this sort of open studios might be slightly different, uh, as I'm currently both living, studying, and working <laughs> within this one space at the moment. So uh, this open studio is also a kind of through the keyhole moment. Um, yeah, so I think it was important. I, I mean, I applied to do this because I think it was important to kind of show a kind of honest representation of what it is like uh, for a lot of people, a lot of, uh, you know, disadvantaged people working right now um, as practitioners is that the reality of it is, is very much your bedroom does look like this. Um, but yeah, so again, thank you for coming along and thanks for the RSA for having me and the Times as well. That was a, a real joy. So um, I'll share my screen and I'll show you um, the work that I've got in the RSA annual, if you can see it here. It's titled Wait 2020, um, and it's a photographic print of a temporary installation made back in March 2020, just before the first lockdown. So this work explores the illusion of control with the vast majority of pedestrian buttons in the UK actually being placebos, um, granting a kind of average waiting period um, that doesn't actually correlate with the space itself, but grants us, each of us the kind of superficial agency to control urban social happenings. So the relocation of this object to the kind of vast Scottish landscape attempts to query mass instruction, usability and the sublime present in the everyday. With just over a year now since since I put this up, I mean, it was yeah back in March. I see it as a kind of a sign of what was to come. It sort of feels like a much more important work than I ever thought it was going to be. Um, and as we continue to sort of be uh, continuing the situation we're in now and sort of continue to be led astray by the powers that be we sort of I still feel like we're in this kind of we're still in this endless waiting period kind of pressing the button over and over again in an attempt to kind of grasp back some control of our environment or something um but yeah but yeah so that's my work and I'll I'll give you a show around shall I I'll stop sharing now um so during Covid I've been working as you can see, without access to resources, materials or a studio space. Uh, so everything you can see around me, uh, I've gathered are kind of found materials, fly tipped objects or borrowed, borrowed from people and from junkyards and things. So um, I'll pretty much take anything I can get my hands on. I think if I were to describe my working process, it is mostly that. Um, and I'll either adapt to make plans for it here or um, or just take it straight outside with the camera and start kind of like playing around with the context and placement of it. That's what I've sort of been doing at the moment. Obviously, there's have to be adjustments to the way I'd usually work in a more kind of sculptural way. But, you know, I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it with a pinch of salt. Um, so since making way, uh, I've sort of con I've continued working with these objects of the street. Um, so without access to white space or anything my everyday surroundings and the roads themselves sort of became the context for where I'm now showing my work and where it's where it's going to go and where it lives so I'm currently working on this series of of what I'm calling roadworks um which in the end will be an artist book about I've got about over 150 images so far and kind of continuing to grow of these kind of bricolage scenarios or 
glitches in the everyday that kind of aim to queer spaces and objects of use. Um, I also use quite a lot of text in my work as well. So there will be within the artist book a kind of experimental narrative that weaves the images together and sort of takes the part of me who is this person kind of acting as the flaneur of the everyday kind of observing these spaces um similar to like you said Lauren like in a kind of psychogeographic way um so I guess I'll take you around first things first um most of the things you can see around me will feature in the roadwork series that I'm making um so the one I'll take you to first this is a um a replica of a pedestrian button that I made um, just last year and it actually has a lit candle inside. Um, so the light from the candle sort of casts the same, it's less good in the light of right now, casts the same kind of iconic orange glow of the wait button is also an object that can be used to measure time and also I sort of wanted to memorialize and pay tribute to the pedestrian button itself um, as something that I worked with for a really long time. Um, another kind of object of mass instruction, as I kind of refer to them, is this, this stop button uh, I've got from the bus here. And this is currently residing on the, the pole handle of broom, uh, which is a kind of prime example, I think, of kind of the way I make work is usually it just ends up being a kind of like a mashing together of things that kind of never usually would be seen together in yeah I guess in quite um in quite a queer way um what else should I show you I guess I'll just show you what else is on so this is kind of where all the stuff goes as you can see I've got a real collection of all the things here everything from like road signs to aerials a trumpet um pretty much anything you could ever need or kind of come across in your everyday anyway and up on the shelves here I've got uh, some arrows, uh, various street signs, uh, rear view mirrors, all my books. Yeah, it's sort of, it has become a kind of mishmash of this studio space as well. It's actually kind of representative of that as a mishmash of my kind of personal life and work life coming together as well. But that is the reality of it. And that is, that is what we're doing. Um, do you have a, do you have a particular liking for yellow? Is that an aesthetic choice? <laughs> <laughs> I, knew, I knew that would come up yeah I guess for me it's it's both an aesthetic choice and yellow is that kind of in between isn't it it sits in between go and stop it's the amber it's a waiting color it's a it's a genderless color um yeah it's it's an important one for me and it does feature a lot and obviously it features a lot you know in the iconography of the streets and of the road signs and everything as well it's that iconic kind of amber yellow that has been popping up a lot um and does feature in the book a lot as well kind of runs throughout it so yeah. these, it's, it's, uh, sorry go on no no these um are a series of these are some shoe soles i've been making at the minute that have um kind of text in them they're cast um silicone so the text kind of comes in and feeds into the grit as well of the shoes so that when you walk with them um an imprint is sort of left and i can show you what that sort of looks like here on this newspaper so you can see that so i've been playing with these footprints as well and these are going to feature in this series of work itself i've actually got a picture of this is one of the images that features in the work where these shoe soles are present in a car park here so um another thing that i've got around me that's going to feature in this work is these arrows these are a, these are a favorite <laughs> these are kind of adapted arrows i've made with these kind of self-supporting structures behind them um and i've been taking these out and about with me um and kind of putting them playing with them in different in different spaces and um i've got another image here from the book of these in situ in a puddle so I put them just sort of playing with the way that different kind of scenes of the street can be reflected in these spaces of puddles and stuff you know it's raining in Glasgow and you've got to work with it so so the arrow as itself supports sort of reflects back and points back at itself and that's what I mean about the kind of the glitchy nature of these of these things um yeah so what else have I got around I could probably I, I 
yeah. seeing your arrows i'm sitting here watching this on the screen and um i've got my little cursor arrow thing and those <laughs> yellow arrows they're a bit like one of those but in real oh, space <laughs> yeah. nice nice arrows are everywhere they're quite mad i should probably be ashamed to not mention this friend um this is one of three pigeons that I have acquired, uh, three fake pigeons I've acquired, I, that I'm making a, a kind of a kinetic revolving sculpture at the moment as part of the series as well. And so these, these come from a, a pigeon hunters kind of machine thing that um, has these three pigeons on a motor and they revolve and it's a kind of like a decoy uh, for other pigeons to kind of come down. So there's these themes of um, of kind of control and chance and authorship as well within these things. And um, yeah, as I said, querying a mass instruction through use of everyday objects in like a kind of strange way. But I also work quite a lot, as I said, um, with text as well. So um, I've got, what are, we, what are we time on, Mary? We got time? Got another, another minute or two. Give me another minute or two. I'll show you this in my last <laughs> final minute. Um, it's topical, topical. Uh, I mean, this is something, this is an artist book as well I made um, at the beginning of lockdown. So it's called um, Language as a Virus 2020. Um, and it essentially, as said here, uh, includes all of the words and uh, redefinitions added to the dictionary between January and September 2020. So the kind of initial first lockdown. So as you kind of go through the book, it has um, all of these additions and redefinitions that have been added. Just sort of, I'm really interested in the way that language travels and, um, and different kind of varying communication approaches. Um, so I became as COVID kind of kicked off and everything and all the kind of and all the kind of political, socio-political conversations that were happening in this kind of like dire time of catastrophe, essentially. I was interested in the way that people were talking and the new words and the way that language continued to grow and mutate and communications were still happening, although in a kind of slightly altered way. And um yeah, and in the way that language can be caught as well, like similarly, like a virus, um, you know, you pick up the idiolects of the people around you and it travels and catches in terms of proximity. So, um, yeah, that's where that came from. Uh, if there's anything else anyone wants to see uh, or is point out or any questions, please, please send them my way. I, I noticed there was a question that was actually addressed to all of you in the Q&A. So, um... Uh, it, which is from Janie and um, which is about how the pandemic's affected your work. And I think you, both you and Lauren have already touched on that, but if you have a look in the Q&A now, you, you might be able to comment on that. Um, I can give you a comment there, Janie. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, Maya. That was really, thank really you. interesting. And um, I, I don't know what sort of degree show you're going to have, if it's going to be a real world degree show or an online degree show. Probably but an online one. <laughs> online one well i mean you can do different things with online shows as we're discovering so it's quite exciting um but we'll definitely be looking out for that thank um thank you very much indeed it was really fascinating and if people would like to see a bit more of maya's work um looking for the what's your um instagram it whatever is, it's called it is mre underscore arts uh you'll find me there please don't hesitate to get in contact with me as well, all the things. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, ha have a look there. There's some more images of uh, the, the work in the street, I think, there, aren't, aren't there? Right, okay, I'm juggling various windows here. Well, next up, we've got, um, if I can get my computer to work, we've got Fenneke uh, Walters Sinker. I apologise if I'm not saying that quite right who's an artist who's originally from Netherlands, but is now based in Aberdeenshire. She worked for a number of years as a photographer, but recently she's been developing a much broader visual arts practice. Um, for example, in 2018, she received a visual arts and craft maker award to attend a non-toxic printmaking residency in Massachusetts in the US. Um, and she has two artist books in the current annual exhibition. 
So I think I will just hand over now and uh, okay. thank you, Fen. I look forward to hearing from you. Okay, thank you, Mary, for the introduction and also for the, uh, having me in the RSA exhibition. I'm really, uh, yeah, chuffed that I have two of my artist books uh, there. And uh, also for, uh, you know, having the opportunity to show my studio uh, here, because actually my studio here in Bankry in Aberdeenshire is very, very small. So I wouldn't be able to have visitors uh, here. So this is actually really perfect. So uh, my plan is to show you the two artist books and then uh, show you uh, around in, <laughs> in my uh, studio. So, uh, and sometimes I have to have a look in my, uh, on my notes. <laughs> so sorry about that. Um, so uh, yeah, the two artist books that I uh, have in the exhibition, they were made during lockdown uh, last year. Um, we were very restricted in our freedom and as a sea kayaker and a mountaineer, I felt really quite disconnected with the sea and the mountains as the environment. Um, and uh, just by making these artist books, uh, I could relive uh, these experiences that I had uh, there before. So for me, that was very cathartic. And uh, just coming back to the question for, uh, that Janie asked, uh, for me, it was I got more productive during the time of lockdown uh, because I had so much more time and I was thinking more and actually on a more deeper level, I think. Um, so I think it has uh, benefited my work in that perspective. So um, my plan now is to switch the camera uh, so you can see. So I need to move a bit and I hope I'm not going to make you dizzy. So one moment. <laughs> so yes, this is the um, first book is called Iluliak um, and that is uh, Iceberg in Greenlandic. Um, in 2018, I went on a sea kayak expedition there and I witnessed uh, well, the carving of icebergs up close and also exploding icebergs. And that sometimes resulted in, uh, in a small tsunami, which was quite uh, scary, actually. Um, this book contains about 100 sheets of folded tracing paper and uh, I've painted that in um, acrylic ink. The, end of this book, so I'm going to move that bit that's here, that represents the ice uh, cap of Greenland, which is the higher part. And then going further down all these icebergs uh, here, and it's all in accordion fold. So I'm going to uh, flick through the pages because I'm going to keep talking because I'd like to show you the, sorry, the visual and the sound. Because the sound, is really representing the crackling of the ice. So this dark blue is more of the, you know, the sea in between. But this tracing paper is, uh, I think it's a lovely sound that corresponds with that, uh, what I experienced there. Especially when I was doing the um, polar bear watch at night, it was so still. Um, and then to see icebergs floating past our campsite, and at one point exploding, which well, gave me a heart attack. Uh, so these are all the different papers. And um, this book is actually not, you can't really close it, but it's flexible. So this is from the side with two hardback um, covers and it's flexible in the spine. It's a lovely. You. It, 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 Sorry. It, it, it's a lovely sculptural object. It's yeah. Um, yeah, not a book that you can close, but it's a sculptural one, and I leave it one side at the back, and one is up, so you can really see the 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 depth in it. So if I go through like that, uh, yeah, it just brings me back to that sort of wonderful time. And last year we were supposed to go back to Greenland, but obviously. We were not able to, and uh, this is for me, uh, yeah, just the summary of such amazing experience there, and um, yeah, that's how I uh, I work with because I'm sea kayak and see so much uh, nature around me, 
uh, I want to work with that in my studio. So that was uh, the first book. And then my second book is, sorry. This is uh, Take Me to the Mountains. And it's very tricky to show, but um, it's a book in a slip case. And uh, if I zoom out a bit, you can see that like that. Um, and it's a uh, slip case is actually two layers. Um, this is covered in monotype print. And uh, this is book cloth here. And um, yeah, so I'm going to put this down so I can show you the book. So this book actually was inspired by all my experiences as a mountaineer in Austria and uh, Scotland because I love ski mountaineering. And um, it was actually uh, last year before the pandemic hit, uh, I was uh, actually recovering from a very painful condition and I was not able to walk at all. And so even, you know, like let alone to go to the mountains. So for me, this was another really cathartic project uh, to work on to stay connected with that stunning environment. And uh, so these are two monotype prints in um, an accordion uh, fold with two, you know, like a hardback cover uh, with book cloth. And uh, I really enjoyed making uh, this um, while I was not able to get out. So these are my two pieces. So bear with me and then I'm going to show you around the studio and zoom out a bit and I need to be careful not to trip over my chair. <laughs> so as you can see this is my uh, desk that I work at uh, and mainly uh, standing for printmaking or paper cutting uh, which I do as well and then I can change the, the angle of the desk and um, well, there's all well, every space is being used in this small studio. So even the lamps, I have some pieces there. And this is uh, a corner where I have lots of art supplies, like my paints, my pens and pencils and stuff, stuff, stuff. <laughs> but also I really like this one. This is the XCut Express, which is a small portable printing press. And that's just perfect for in this small studio to work with. It can print up, uh, uh, what is it, 20 centimeters by 40 centimeters. So yeah, very practical. Then the top of my studio there above, uh, a lot of uh, storage things that I uh, don't need uh, really right at the moment, but I need to uh, I, I can't throw away things so like fabrics I go to charity shops and I get stuff for free uh, papers um, well you name it I've got it there <laughs> and uh, boxes with lots of printmaking uh, supplies all there it all looks very well organized ah, then. well thank you what well, the studio is like <laughs> the thing is you have to do that you know because if it's so small mm. then yeah, uh, and you still want to work. You, and sometimes I'm just moving around things. So I, you know, I have to reorganize things if I want to go. Um, so I can switch it again. If I want to go, you know, like um, do uh, printmaking or uh, paper cutting or whatever it is, it's quite flexible. So that is quite good. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to switch again because I want to show you my, uh, well, this is a bit of a collection of, uh, well, different things. I set this up for just for the um, open studios um, because I like paper folding, as I said, as well. It's uh, really good uh, to practice uh, to get from 2D to 3D. And I've developed that over the last few years. And I've actually learned a lot from people I've connected with uh, uh, well, via Instagram and uh, did some uh, workshops uh, with these people. So. Um, yeah, so there's a variety of things. There's another artist book. Actually, this is a, a, a the original one was sold at the RSA Open in 2018 uh, with original prints. So that was in the exhibition uh, there. But this is uh, just a, um, 
a copy actually for myself uh, with digital prints, not the original prints. And here there's some things that I like to collect from nature. As you can see, the sea urchins and uh, I love lichen, I love birch bark. Um, so I put that in there. Actually, yes, they found this amazing bone folder in the outdoors in Aberdeenshire. I thought, well, wow, that's meant for me. So I just, <laughs> I just uh, collected it and I put it, put it there. And then uh, these are all my uh, books that I've made. Well, not all, but uh, a part of it. Uh, so I keep that there. And um, so this suitcase uh, was something that I will talk a bit more about that if there's time. Um, got and then here, sorry? Got three minutes left. Yeah, no, I, will, I have my plan, so. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> and here are my books, uh, all about paper cutting, printmaking, paper folding, artist books. I mean, uh, I use these a lot uh, next to like Pinterest and Instagram and stuff. But, you know, with these books, uh, I've learned myself to do a lot of things. Um, so then in the corner, there's this old kitchen unit that we used to have in our own kitchen. It's from the 1950s, I think, but my husband cut it in half. And it's perfect when you're printmaking. And um, yeah, I can, uh, I have water here and I can do everything in this little space. Um, so super. Then there's this trolley and I have uh, laid out a few of my works there, but below, I have uh, a lot of paper there and especially seed charts. Um, and I received that from a friend of mine who is a kayaker as well. And uh, she sailed all around the UK. So she was very kind to give me uh, these um, maps from uh, UK, well, mainly Scotland and Ireland. So I made, for example, this one this year during lockdown. Um, and this is called uh, the Jura, my Jura journey planner, because I was dreaming about my next kayak expedition. And uh, so I made this, well, like a, yeah, a folder. That's with an elastic band. And some, yeah, just working with papers. Uh, they all used seat charts that you can take all of these out. Uh, all, all of my books actually are on my website. Uh, you can see how I work with them. So that's better to <laughs> view uh, on, uh, on my website or um, and there. But anyway, so this is uh, a divider. So that's mainly for sailing people using that, but I thought it would suit really well uh, for this uh, project. And um, when you open this, I'm not going to do that now, um, because it's very big and, and I can't do that with one hand. Uh, it's the actual size of a map, it's huge, but it's all folded in a particular way. And then buttons, it's very difficult to zoom in and to see it's uh, sharp. Anyway, these are buttons made from the maps as well. We're, we're just running out of time. Oh, already? Uh, already? Yeah, oh, give us a quick, a very quick oh, tour around the rest of the table, um, just in a quick minute. <laughs> yeah. This. This is a binoculars that I use, and that was well before the pandemic, um, because I was stuck at home uh, recovering, and the birds uh, kept me sane. So I made this from cardboard, uh, cardboard, and with the Biodiversity Heritage Library images, they're uh, available for free. So this is for me a very uh, personal project, and so that's what I wanted to sh uh, show as well. And that uh, is. In a nutshell, me, really. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. I'm so excited by this sculptural paper folding. I mean, I, I've seen books that are interactive and, and so on before, but I don't remember ever seeing anything quite as sculptural as some of those that you're making. So that's really thank exciting. Thank you, yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Um, Right, so if anyone would like to see more of Fen's work, it's www.fenfolio.com or at Fenfolio on Instagram, and uh, then you can have explore at your leisure. <laughs> so thanks again, that was really fantastic. Um, so we're going to move on to our final studio today, uh, that of Olivia Turner, 
who is a painter trained in Edinburgh. She's exhibited widely and is currently president of the Society of Scottish Artists, which um, many of us are well acquainted with as a group that actively promotes all sorts of opportunities for artists, as well as having a really lively annual exhibition. She's won a number of prizes and awards, including the RSA's Latimer and William Gillis Bequest Awards in 2016, and um, the Open Contemporary Young Artist Award in 2018. So I am going to hand over now to Olivia and uh, I'll try not to interrupt too much. <laughs> no, thank you, Mary, and thank you for having me this evening. Um, so I guess I'm just going to do a little studio talk for you tonight um, and I guess speak through my process and kind of how I get to my paintings. Uh, so behind me here, you can see uh, the two works that I've got in the exhibition and I'll talk a bit more about those later on. Um, and I just want to talk a bit about kind of place and why it's important to me. And I suppose all my work is based around architecture and structures and visiting places and experiencing a place and how I can then represent a place and create a new space within that. And I always kind of play around with the ideas of two dimensional, three dimensional spaces and kind of what I am showing the viewer and what are they experiencing from what I show them. Um, and on that note, I suppose I should maybe mention the title of my works. Um, so I do title my works with postcodes and people always ask me why I do this. And I suppose one of the things is naming your works never easier. That's definitely one thing. Um, but I also kind of want to play around the idea that these postcodes are not necessarily the actual place that I've ex ex experienced from. And so I kind of say, for instance, I've used two spaces to make one painting. I'll co combine these together. So the space that then people can see it might not necessarily be the space I've used, but it's got some inspiration from the area. So it's kind of just like play around with numbers and letters and just my little like nod back to where I've kind of made the work from. Um, so I'll just kind of talk you a bit through my process now. Um, so I've got some drawings to kind of show you on my desk. You can see that. Um, so as I kind of mentioned, I will generally visit a place to start off with and photograph a lot of it. Then once I've done that, I will come back to my studio and I generally make up these A1 contact sheets. As I kind of do this, I guess sometimes compositions will come naturally or they might not, um, but it's just kind of a way for me to familiarise myself again with the space, pick out elements I find of interest, look at areas that might work in paintings, but I suppose pause, just get as much down as possible. And I might revisit these three or four times after I've made paintings and look back at them. And I sometimes get excited, I suppose, when I've been to a place, try get all the favourite things down first and then kind of leave the other bits. And then, so I'll come back again and really dig deeper again to try get as much out as possible. Um, but I think it's important to visit this place just so I can get my own impression of it. And I guess different angles and viewpoints and just so, and not almost see past the surface of something. And I guess that's what kind of came important a few years ago. I kind of got to visit a space inside in more detail and it kind of came clear that it is not just about seeing the facade of a building, it is about work, seeing the workings inside and how I interpret that. So it kind of, that was kind of different journey, I guess, for my work and it's kind of opened up a bit more. Um, so that's good. And then I'll just take you around here. Um, so on my wall, I don't know if you can see these very well because they're just trace and I like to see that people love trace as much as I do. Um, so I kind of, um, as was, once I've made the contact sheets, I will then kind of do like 10, 20 drawings before I get to a composition that kind of I'm happy with and I'll translate into a painting. Um, even if I want to change a bit, I'll just draw the whole thing again. I think I can just carry on tweaking. Um, I am a bit of a perfectionist, so that sometimes comes into it a bit. Um, so there's a bit of different ones on the wall. There's some kind of more abstract ones. Some are just looking at areas that I'm just focusing on detail. And then some are trying to bring compositions together and seeing how they'll work, um, looking at scale, I suppose. Um, but drawing is a massive part of my work. And sometimes people kind of ask, do I ever draw online? Uh, just draw online, draw on a computer. But I normally just do it all by hand. And I think there's more freedom in that and some more enjoyment, I guess. Um, and then I'll just take you around here to show you the works that are in the show. Uh, I thought probably better to show them in real life rather than on the screen. Um, so these are just two of the paintings I've got in the exhibition. Uh, so the one on the left was actually made for an uh, exhibition I had in 2019 uh, at Biscuit Factory in Newcastle. And it kind of looked at um, a site that I revisited. So it was St Peter's Seminary, which is in Glasgow, which is now abandoned and kind of left uh, for ruin. Um, 
but I visited the site back in 2015 and I based my degree shit on that. But I managed to go back in 2019 and kind of they cleaned it up a bit so it was easier to see inside the space a bit better. So I think for me, this is where I kind of got a turning point in my work and I started to become more abstract in what I was presenting and kind of not giving the viewer as much information. Um, so there is a few bits of like, you can see kind of like staircase here, but I tried to like open up the composition in the middle just so people can, I suppose, weed the way in and out of it. Um, so I think, yeah, like I say, that's kind of opened up and kind of moved my work into a new direction. I also found that I was kind of making spaces that were actual pieces of architecture and could be made, even though they weren't in a sense. And I felt like I was grounding the work almost. It had to sit on something. So I think with these, I tried to like open them up more so they are floating in space, but they're also there's not much that's connecting them to the ground. I guess in this kind of with the stairs, it is a bit, but I think the rest of it's kind of free, um, moving and flowing. Um, have, have you ever, Olivia, have you ever had any reaction from architects? Oh yeah, a lot. And people think I'm an architect, but I'm actually not. Um, yeah. I've just got an interest, I suppose. And I guess I shouldn't mention that I guess my mon interest is from like brutalist and modernist architecture is kind of where my inspiration comes from. And mainly because, well, I love concrete. That's one of the reasons <laughs> but the, just the structures are so overpowering. And I think they were a big part of society, I guess, back in the day when they were built, especially after the World Second World War. And I think it's really important that people still see these buildings as value and they've changed a point in time. And I, I, think I, I was just wondering, I'm married to an architect oh, and, <laughs> and so you know things that stand up and stuff like that how do, how do they have they ever you don't get any yeah that's what I mean I think I was kind of getting into where it's like oh can I make this can I not make it and it was maybe in the back of my mind and so I wanted to be more playful I guess that's the enjoyment of being a painter I can play around and do what, I, uh, what I otherwise am. you'd be an architect well yeah exactly so I think that's so definitely allows me to play a bit more but I did want to become more free and kind of make more abstract spaces rather than what could be a physical building so I think that was interesting and I suppose what Lauren was saying as well about removing it from the original environment just to let it speak for itself and just to give the viewer a different approach in it and let them approach it how they want to um, and then this is another the other piece in the exhibition so I made this last year for an exhibition that was down in London um, and this was looking at body research from Berlin um, and once again, I tried to abstract the elements a bit further and open up the space and kind of play around with what's in the foreground, what's in the background by, I guess, that leaving areas like up here and down here, kind of more the colour of the background. So it opened up. Um, and I guess for this other piece, I was also leading the viewer in a different direction. So bring them in at the stairs at the side so they can work the way around it slightly differently. Um, so those are the two works in the show. I'll give you a quick close up as I go past just so you can see. So for me, finish is like my number one thing that I'm like obsessed with basically. Uh, the flatter the better really. So um, I'll just give you a walk through to this one. Um, and that's something I've like kind of finessed over the years trying to get them as flat as possible just so the structure I suppose can speak to themselves. Uh, and I'll just take you around here. So I've not been in the studio too long. Uh, I've only been in a few months, so I'm kind of just settling in a bit. Um, so I thought I'd just show you one of my palettes that I kind of use. So a lot of people, my paintings are generally blues and grey tones, with sometimes a hint of colour that will lead your eye across the picture. Um, and even though they do look very similar, I guess all my palettes are different for each series of paintings. So you can just obviously see here, these are all my, painting, my paintings that I've done, and I number them all, I'm quite obsessive in structure. So I like to see that Lauren is as well, which is nice. And just where I've been mixing around the paint, and uh, this is just another one here that I've done. And this was for a different piece of work that I had to fit in. I got some concrete frames made for the work. So I had to try and match the colours. So that was a bit of a different challenge for me um, to do. So that was quite an interesting process, trying to get the colours right for that. Um, so that's just that. And then I'll just take you around. There are my paints there. You can see I, I eat a lot of honey. Uh, and then I'll just move you around to what I'm kind of been working on recently, which is slightly different. Uh, um, there are, I'm just going to interrupt you, Olivia, because you might not have time to address these questions, but a couple yeah. of questions have come in. Uh, one from Fran Chambers is, what kind of paint are you using? Oh, just acrylic. So um, generally acrylic and maybe a slightly bit of medium in just to get the surface as flat as possible and then just build it up generally in layers to remove as many brush strokes. But, um, wow. And I might paint a, uh, one section about eight times 
it's literally that bad. <laughs> So I, I can understand that. Uh, and we've got another um, question here from Wendy McMurdo, and she's asking whose work you're most looking at now. I don't. It's interesting because I don't really look at artists' work as as funny as it sounds. I guess I'm generally it's just architects. I guess that are the inspiration. Um, when I was in Berlin, it was a lot of like a boosty, and I do want to look at more of his work in detail. Um, but it is just generally me investigating, going out and trying to find spaces that catch my eye. Um, and brutalist architecture I try to hunt down. So it is probably more architects, I would say, than artists in general. Um, I think. Yeah, okay, um, sorry about my message. Tone. Sorry, I'll just run you through these quickly before I run out of time. Sure. Um, so these are just works that I've been doing recently um, with a technique called marquetry, I think it is. Um, so um, they're basically wood veneer panels that I've cut out um, and applied to a surface. So this kind of started, I was just clearing out one of my grandpa's houses and I found these veneers and there was a picture that someone had made but it was more like of a house and I thought oh maybe I could incorporate those and it almost seems quite nice to bring it back as I guess these buildings when they're cast in concrete the moulds that they use would generally be wood and so they would be the wood grain um, so it seemed a quite a nice connection so I've been playing around with these this is one of them and uh, these are two of the ones and these are just test the ones before I got to the final things because as I mentioned the perfection gets the better of me um, but I think what was interesting about this is because I normally try, I suppose, take away the surface and try to get as flat as possible, it was interesting working with grain and different colour tones and so I think it has opened a new avenue into my work. And um, that this one up here is kind of one that got away because as you do it, it's quite delicate and working with the natural material, which I don't normally do. Obviously the grain, it can split generally, so I think playing around it's kind of abstracted the work into a different um, where these compositions that I used for this were from a series of paintings that I had in the RSA Redux show last year. And I thought I would just use the same compositions, but just see how putting it into another process would change the outcome. So I think I'm going to carry on pushing that and seeing where it goes. And this top one here was actually the first piece that I've completed in the studio. And it came from posting more research and I just, this element I just felt sat better by itself and just see how it, if it is strong enough to be by itself. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at at the moment um I, I, we've actually got some we are running out of time but i've got a supplementary question here from wendy <laughs> <laughs> yeah. she she's asking if you're thinking about issues such as class for example in the work so i suppose about the people who are using the structures or is I it, did is start it that more i suppose yeah when i was at uni i did start to look a lot about class and it and then that kind of led me down to like Grace and Perry and kind of people that are using the structures and because a lot of these spaces that I do influence from are like council estates and just working class building the people at work. So I think it is in the back of my mind that it is conscious and I suppose it's interesting now because some of these people that maybe lived in these buildings don't even like them anymore, but they've been a significant part of their housing. So I think, yeah, it's something that's the back of mind. I don't necessarily want to push it, I guess, to the forefront of my work, but I think it is. There is definitely a discussion worth having there with people about it. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. And I think this sort of into concrete and back out of concrete and into the veneers, I think that's a really interesting development. And unfortunately, it's eight o'clock. <laughs> Thank you so much, um, Olivia. Um, <laughs> Uh, if if people would like to contact the artists to follow up on this, as I say, uh, they're, they're all on Instagram. Olivia is at Libby Turner um, and she has a website www.olivia-turner.com. Um, and I mean, that was just so fantastic to see four such different practices um, and, and to get a bit of insight into, into the way you work. And everyone who's watching, uh, go and explore the RSA annual because there's a lot more rich stuff in there to, to find. So thank you all so much. And I'm gonna hand back now to Sheena. Yep, I'd just like to say thanks very much, Miri, for cheering tonight. And thank you, of course, to our four artists. Our third open studios is on the 4th of May. So don't miss that. And uh, thank you again to everybody for coming and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks very much. Bye.